Good evening and welcome once again to The Word on Wednesdays. Um, just a, another ministry here at Calvary Chapel Heartland where we set out to just teach God's Word. And so um, why don't we teach God's Word word for word here at Calvary Chapel? Well, primarily so that we have a better understanding of what God has intent for us in our lives and just a better understanding of His Word overall. But in order to really understand it, we've got to have that foundation we talked about the last few weeks, that foundation that we find right here in Genesis, the foundation for all other scripture. And so that's where we're at in this study in Genesis. And last week, we finished chapter 2, where we took a closer look at the creation of mankind and the earth. What a beautiful place, right? Just God plants a garden with everything man needs, and he puts man there. And uh, he breathes life into man. Uh, the whole setting is just beautiful. He just gives him one rule. One rule. And of course, we know how that turned out. Or we're about to see how that turned out actually tonight. And so, uh, but before we get into that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for the opportunity to come before you, to sit together. And to look at your word, we just pray, Lord, that you speak into us now, that you speak your word into our hearts and our minds, that you give us wisdom, you open our ears and our hearts to hear what you have for us. And so we ask you to join us here right now, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So back in the garden, this beautiful garden where God has put man... He's actually given man a partner, a helper. And, and right at the end of the chapter, we see how that's going to play out. He gives us a little preview of what that whole relationship is, is going to be about or, or the dynamics of the man and woman in that relationship when he talks about uh, husband and wife and mother and father. And he gives us the ideal family picture of what family is going to be all about. And everything's perfect. Everything is good. Except there's one rule. And it doesn't take long before the rule is broken. And that's where we're at tonight. We're going to start in chapter 3 in verse 1 where he says, Now the serpent... The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Stop right there for a minute. To start with, the text here really doesn't by itself clearly say that the serpent is Satan. But we know from many other passages in the Bible that that's exactly who this is. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel 28 tells us Satan, before his fall, was an angel of the highest rank. He, he was even a worship leader in heaven. He also tells us that Satan was in Eden. So we know he was in the garden. And there are many other passages throughout the Bible that talk about this Satan. They associate Satan with a serpent or a snake-like creature. Even in Revelation, he talks about, speaks of the dragon, that serpent of old. So we know that the serpent is Satan himself. Isaiah tells us that Satan's fall had to do with his desire to actually be equal to or greater than God. And it's interesting because that's actually what he's going to try to get man to do. Because remember what the rule, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, why they were not to eat of it? Because they would now be like God or know, have the knowledge of God. And so Satan's going to try to get them because he wants to be like God. That's his goal. But his effectiveness we're going to see right here, as we see in that first verse, his effectiveness actually comes from his crafty ways, from being cunning. 
We can't outsmart Satan. You cannot outsmart him. He's crafty. He's cunning. Only through the power of Jesus Christ can we overcome him. And that's important to remember. As a matter of fact, it was his craftiness that made him successful against Eve. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us, But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So we see that it was his craftiness that deceived Eve. And it's his craftiness that we don't stand a chance against ourselves apart from Christ. So we need to, to be aware of that. And we'll see a little bit later on why that's important, um, to be able to, to withstand or to uh, go against Satan and not be deceived. So he said in that first verse, he said to the woman, it's interesting, we think of a snake, we think of the serpent, and now we think of a serpent or the snake speaking to the woman. And so, I, first off, I don't, I don't know that it, he was already a snake at this point. He's some sort of creature in the garden. But we'll see in a few minutes when the curse, that's when God says, now you'll go on your belly and slither off and be on your belly for the rest of your life. So, but there's some sort of creature, and he's speaking to Eve. And it's interesting because Eve doesn't seem to be shocked by the fact that this creature is speaking to her, right? But we know from Scripture and other places that it's not uncommon for demons to actually possess man and animals. We see in Luke, Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. So we know that there is scriptural uh, basis for the demons being able to inhabit man and animals at different times. And so on this occasion, we see Satan inhabiting some creature, and speaking to Eve. Now, we don't know if, if the voice was the creature itself speaking or if Satan was speaking and Eve was just hearing it in her head. Whatever it says, it says that he's speaking to Eve and Eve understands what's going on. But why Eve? Why tempt Eve? Why did he go to Eve first? I believe he went to Eve first because she did not receive the command from God directly. Remember when God gave the command to not eat of the tree? He gave the command to Adam before Eve was even created. So Eve got the command through Adam, from Adam, second hand, if you will. So maybe Satan knew, okay, she didn't hear God actually say it, so there's room now for me to maybe sow just a little seed of doubt. So I'll go to the one where I have the opportunity to maybe sow a seed of doubt, right? I can make her question. Well, did God really say that? You didn't hear it. You're just taking that guy's word for it, right? So he goes to Eve and he says, has God indeed said did God really say that? Just give her enough confusion, enough doubt. See, once he has sown a little bit of doubt, then he's broken in, he's, he's laid a little groundwork. Now he can just come out and just lie to you. And, and he, he does it by undermining God's word. Did God really say that? And you notice he does that all throughout Scripture, and He does that even in our lives. Is that really what God said? Is that really what God meant? He's trying to sow doubt into God's Word and into our interpretation of God's Word. That's why it's so important that we stay grounded in the Word, that we stay grounded in truth. That's the only way to withstand that deception. So he goes on in verse 2 and he says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, 
But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So the first mistake Eve makes is, she responds and she starts to have a conversation with him. It's one thing to respond to Satan, but the response from us should be, go away. Just go away, Satan. I'm not even going to entertain this conversation. But she does. She entertains the conversation and she starts speaking back to the serpent. And it's interesting because another reason we, we, we think, I think he went to Eve first is when Adam gave Eve the command, either he paraphrased, we don't know what he said exactly, but we know that Eve added to the command. She adds something that God did not say. She says, nor shall you touch it. God never said that to Adam. So where'd she get that from? So I can just picture Adam saying, hey, we're not supposed to. It, she also doesn't call the tree by its name. She just says, and of the tree in the midst of the garden. I can just see Adam saying, hey, that tree over there in the middle, just don't go near it and don't touch it. You know, that would keep her from eating from it, maybe. Maybe that's not a bad instruction in and of itself, but that's not exactly what God said, is it? And it just takes that little bit of room or wiggle room for Satan to be able to come in now and say, hey, is that really what he said? Are you sure that's what he said? It's always a good idea to completely teach God's word and teach it just the way God said it and accurately. Matthew chapter 15 reminds us, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. It's better to teach God's commandments and not man's and the doctrine of man. So it might have been Adam's fault all along. He may not have just communicated well with Eve. We don't know. But the serpent replies, then the serpent says in verse 4, he, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So now he directly challenges God's word. You surely won't die. Surely not, right? He's drawn Eve into this discussion with him. He's planted this seed of doubt in her mind. He, he's really got her now in a position. And then notice he, though, he uses a little bit of truth. He says that if you eat of it in that day, God knows your eyes will be open. That's true. That is what God said. So he takes this line, he, he throws in just enough truth to make it sound like that is what God said, right? And that's what he does with us as well. Remember, he's the great deceiver. He will use God's word to his advantage, even in our lives. And so he throws in just enough truth to make it sound right, but it's not truth. And Ephesians warns us that we are never, we should never give place to the devil. You cannot let him get a foothold at the very beginning. So any conversation we engage in with Satan should be, nope, that's enough, go away. We shouldn't even engage. But he tells her, you, sh you will not surely die. Basically what he's trying to tell Eve is, the consequences surely won't be that bad. And I think that's what he does with us as well. He wants to minimize the consequences of sin. He minimizes the consequence. We think about, well, that sin, the consequences surely won't be that bad, right? But we know the consequence of any sin is death. But he wants us to not think of it in that way. And that's what he's doing with Eve. Ah, surely you won't die, right? Because when we look at it that way, it makes it so much easier for us to 
go after those pleasures of sin and not be able to withstand them, even though we know that they're just passing pleasures. Very temp- but, but it's the temptation. And he's tempting her, and he tempts us. And he's tempting with just enough truth, saying your eyes will be opened, and that's true. He also tempts her in another way. He says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. It's that enticement of that goes after what we would call pride, right? Yeah, your eyes will be open. You will be like God. So what does she do? Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. She surrendered to the temptation. And she surrendered to the temptation in exactly the same way that's described to us in 1 John Chapter 2, verse 16, where it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You see, the first she gave in to the lust of the flesh. She saw that it was good for food. It's a fleshly thing. Then she gave in to the lust of the eyes where it was pleasant to the eyes. It looked good. It was beautiful. It was pretty. And then she gave in to the pride of life. It was desirable to make one wise. That's the pride issue. You know Jesus was tempted in the very same way, that same threefold way, out in the desert. At first it was an appeal to his physical appetite, then an appeal to his covetous and emotional desires, the pleasing to the eyes, eyes, and then an appeal to his pride. The exact same. It's Satan's pattern. It's his pattern with all of us in life. That's the way he gets us. That's what, what sin, that's the form that it takes. And we, we see that she was deceived. First Timothy even reminds us that Eve was deceived when she sinned. You see, in her mind, she thought she was doing something good. She thought she was doing something good for herself. And so she took of the fruit and she ate it. But here's the thing. She's still responsible because she took and she ate it. She still had the opportunity to turn and walk away and say no. Satan couldn't f- force it down her throat. He couldn't, he couldn't force her. But he deceived her and he tempted her and she took and she ate. But God always makes a way for us and he made a way for Eve. She could have turned and walked away but he always makes a way of escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 reminds us that No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So it's important that we're grounded in God's word and we remember that because he's going to tempt you. He's going to tempt me. He tempts us all the time. But we have to remember that he always makes a way of escape. And we have the power through Jesus Christ to say, no, get away from me, Satan. And don't even engage him in the conversation. And the way we do that, though, is by knowing God's word. By having that foundation and that solid grounding in God's word. She also, in that passage, she gave to her husband who was with her. So not only did Eve sin, even though she was deceived, she still sinned, she still took it, 
but she became the agent of temptation for Adam. But here's the thing. When Adam ate, he wasn't deceived like Eve was. Adam was the one that had been given the direct command by God, and he sinned with his eyes wide open. He knew what God had said, and he took it from her anyway, and he ate. So it's Adam and not Eve who really bears the responsibility for the fall of the human race and the introduction of death into the created order. As a matter of fact, it tells us all through Romans in chapter 5, he says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. In 1 Corinthians, it says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. See, Eve was tricked into sinning, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Adam, matter of fact, 1 Timothy specifically tells us, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. You see, no matter what Adam's motivation was, he clearly rebelled against God, just outright rebelled against God. And verse 7 tells us, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So it was seemingly only after Adam and the sin of Adam that now their eyes became opened and they knew they were naked. What does that mean, they knew they were naked? They knew they were naked in the sense of they were naked, but also in the sense that their shame is now exposed for all creation. They're vulnerable. Some, some might say, well, didn't they already know they were naked? Yeah, maybe, in a sense. But it's interesting. In Psalm 104, for example, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. And then in Matthew, he says, And he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. So these verses kind of suggest that there was a type of covering already for them. They were naked physically, but they had God's light. Remember? God was the first light in the garden. And it suggests that that. This God's light can be a garment for righteous, a garment of righteousness. So it may have been that they were just previously clothed in God's light. They were physically naked, but, but their shame, their guilt, it, it was different. It was, a, you know, because there was no shame, there was no guilt, there was none of that stuff. And now with sin entering the world, now that light's gone, that covering now they have to be covered again. That covering is gone. And for whatever, whatever it was, at this point, there's a change. There's a change in the way they see each other, and there's a change in the way they see the world around them. Because after the fall, everything looks different. And it looks worse. So what it's the first thing they attempt to do is they attempt to cover themselves up. They sew fig leaves together. They attempt to cover their own nakedness before God. But it was foolish. And we're going to see that in just a few verses from now. God's actually going to have to clothe them. The fig leaves weren't doing it. And uh, the fig leaves, I understand, are actually kind of prickly. Well, probably wouldn't feel very good either. But... But God's got to provide the covering, just as He provides the covering for us through Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is our cloth, clothing, our covering as well. In Revelation chapter 3, we studied a couple of months ago when we started Revelation here. Verse 5, he says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then in verse 18, he goes on, he says, I counsel you to buy 
from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. In other words, we need to put on the clothes of Jesus. We need to put on Jesus Christ himself as our covering garment. <coughs> Galatians says, chapter 3, verse 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We have to put on Christ. He's our covering. <clears throat> Even in Revelation, Jesus gives us this exhortation. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Make sure you're covered with the clothing of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, he goes on, he says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So even though they had tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves, they still hid because they, st they knew it wasn't enough. They knew they were still exposed and they were hiding from God. I find it interesting too. They knew when they heard the Lord coming. He was walking in the garden. I find that interesting because there's several places in the Bible. Uh, for example, in, in John where he says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. First Timothy says, no man has ever seen God in the person of the Father. So we know the only, the only time anyone has seen God has been in the person of Jesus Christ. I think this was Jesus walking in the garden with them. Because no one has seen God according to His own word at any time. But Adam and Eve were in the presence of God in the garden. He was walking in the garden. They could hear him walking in the garden. So I believe him. I'm not going to you know, stake uh, everything on it, but that was Jesus in the garden. We know he was in the beginning. We know he created everything. We saw that two weeks ago. But they hid themselves. And it shows that they knew their attempt to cover themselves had failed. It, it, it's just like us trying to cover our sins. You cannot do enough good works to cover your own sins. You have to have Jesus Christ as your covering. And God says, where are you? And that's an interesting question. You think God didn't know where they were at? He knew exactly where they were at. But why is he asking where are you? He knew there's a gulf now, that this divide between man and him that only he can bridge. But he goes on and he confronts them right there and he confronts them and their sin very directly. In verse 10 he says, So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. This is Adam saying, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And then in verse 11, God answers and he says, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And then the man said, the woman who you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. See, it was sin. It was Adam's sin that made him afraid now all of a sudden of the presence of God. Because up until this point, they'd never hidden from God. He was afraid. You ever let your sin make you afraid to make you want to hide from God? Yeah, I really don't want to hear from you right now, Lord. <laughs> afraid of what he might say. And ever since Adam... That's what we've been doing, though, as men, as men and women. We've been running from God. We've been running and running and running and trying to hide from God. 
It's not until we embrace and accept the person of Jesus Christ that we can stop running and stop hiding from God. But he asked them all these questions. And the thing is, God knew not only where they were at, but he knew why they were there. He knew how they got there. He knew the answer to all the whys and the hows. But why do you think he asked Adam the questions? Because he needed Adam to admit to what he had done. And he's given him a chance to come clean and to repent. And just like he does us. That's why it's so important. God knows exactly what we do. So why do we have to say it? Why do we have to come out and confess it? We have to come out and confess it because he needs us to acknowledge it, to own up to it, and to repent from it. And that's what he's doing for Adam. But look what Adam says. First, let's just notice God hasn't addressed Eve yet. He's just addressed Adam. Because Adam is the head. Adam's the problem here. But what does Adam say? The woman. The woman did it. The woman gave it to me. So he attempts to blame Eve. Isn't that completely consistent with our own human nature today? Is to immediately try to shift blame away from ourselves? It was her fault. But significantly here, I think, is that not only does he try to shift blame to her, but then he even throws in and goes after God himself. The woman who you gave to me. So it's your fault because you gave her to me. Well, blame you, God. Have you ever tried to blame God for your own sins, your own troubles in life? I know many that have. I probably have a few times myself. And that's what Adam, Adam's just being a man because sin has completely corrupted. In verse 13, God says, okay, well, let's turn to the woman then. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? One simple question. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Actually, that's factual. We've already seen scripturally that she was deceived. The serpent did deceive her and she ate. So she kind of owns up to it. The serpent deceived me and I ate. She doesn't necessarily shift the blame. She just kind of says what it is. The problem is the act of being deceived, allowing herself to be deceived, was sin in and of itself. And, and that's where... So she's not completely off the hook. She did sin. We know that it's sin when we exchange the truth of God for the lie. And Satan had lied. The truth of God had been given to Adam. Satan had lied, and she exchanged the two. In Romans chapter 1, it tells us, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So sin has entered the world. And it's going to affect all of mankind for the rest of history. So now God's got to deal with it. And so God is going to deal with it. And here comes the curse. Starting in verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. 
On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So God starts by going directly to where it all started with the serpent. Because he started it, right? But you notice when God spoke to Adam and Eve, he asked them questions to get them to confess their sins and to see where they were at. He doesn't ask the serpent anything. He just immediately pronounces a curse on him. There was really nothing to teach Satan. Satan's a fallen angel that God already knows his heart and where he's at. So he just goes straight to the curse and he commands that the serpent is now going to slither on the ground instead of walking on legs this is kind of the indication where maybe he wasn't necessarily a snake to begin with, but now he's going to be, and instead of uh, like all the other animals, I've got to wonder what Adam and Eve are thinking while this is going on. If they're watching this happen, they got to be thinking, oh, what's going to happen to us? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen when it's my turn, right? But he places the serpent on the ground. He says, you're going to eat dust the rest of your life. And I'm going to put this enmity between you and mankind. It's, it's a natural animosity. It's an ill will. There's going to be a hatred now between Satan and mankind. This antagonism. So this friendship that Eve started out with this creature, that's gone. And now there's going to be this natural fear. And the serpent's going to eat dust the rest of the days of its life. That, that's kind of an interesting uh, statement to eat dust. It's a, this idea of total defeat. You're done. You're never going to win. So you might as well give it up. Of course, he's not going to give it up, right? In Isaiah, he says, and dust shall be the serpent's food. And then Micah says, they shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of you. So God's judgment on Satan is basically just, you're always going to know defeat. That's just the way it's going to be. Jesus is going to be the victor. He tells him right there in that passage about you're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. It's, Jesus wins. The Romans tells us, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. This idea of bruising his head or, or him bruising his heel. It's interesting about bruising the heel. Satan's the snake now on the ground. Where's the heel? Down by the ground. Snake. So Satan's going to get a little nibble, but that's it. And we see that with uh, Jesus when he was on the earth as man. But Jesus is the victor. He wins in the end. It also kind of speaks of in this passage about the virgin birth. Notice he says, this enmity between you and this uh, woman's seed. He speaks of woman's seed in there. Between your seed and her seed. Anybody know how childbirth works in human anatomy? Where's the seed come from? Man. But here, the one time it's going to be woman's seed. It's because that, that speaks directly to the virgin birth. There's no man involved in that. So he's cursed Satan. And then he turns to the woman in verse 16 and says, To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So he first, the first curse put on the woman is this multiplied sorrow. You see, men and women, we all have sorrow. 
We all suffer from sorrow from time to time in our lives. But there's something about that's just kind of unique about the sorrow of women. I mean, just look at the way women have been treated, cre- I'm sorry, treated throughout history. It's because of the curse. And so for you women, I... I bow down, you've had to put up with, you have to put up with so much because of the curse. But here's the thing, that can be overcome through Jesus Christ. That unique experience that, and he also talks about their childbirth and and the pain in childbirth, but I think it goes even more than just the actual birth of the child, but just in child rearing. And the pain the woman goes through versus the man. And the desire for the husband actually kind of speaks of this inherent challenge. The husband's going to be the head over you and you're going to have a desire for him. Now there's going to be this this conflict. You know why it's so hard for the world without Jesus Christ being the center of the marriage? It's hard for the world for women to be submissive to their husbands because they have this natural desire, this natural desire. There's this natural enmity there. That, that word desire is actually used in uh, chapter 4 when he talks about the desire of sin to master over Cain. So now Eve's got to fight this desire to master her husband and actually submit in, in order to, for the home to have order. Just uh, so much because of the curse. So much because of sin. Because of the fall. Sin corrupts. And it just corrupts everything. It corrupts all. But then he goes on in verse 17 and says, Then to Adam he said, Now to Adam... Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So here's the thing. It wasn't just that Adam took Eve's advice. It was actually Adam chose Eve over God. Adam knew the command. Adam knew what was at stake. But he chose Eve over God. He chose idolatry of Eve over God. And because of the curse on man now, the ground, which previously had produced nothing but good, is now going to still produce good, but there's going to produce more thorns and thistles. And before, when Adam tended the garden, which was work, but it wasn't hard work, Now, because of the curse, there's going to be an element of pain and weariness in the work. In Job, chapter 7, he says, Is there not a time of hard service for man on earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hired man, like a servant who earnestly desires the shade, and like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages? Work is now going to be hard for the rest of man's life. And then the final part of the curse is just death. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The only way to end this toil and his labor on the earth is through death. Death 
as a result of Adam's sin, is also extended to the entire human race. All through chapter 5 of Romans, there are many passages, but basically it says that because of Adam's sin entered the world, death came to all mankind, death reigned over man in creation, all men were condemned, and all men were made sinners. We cannot escape the curse. We cannot cover our own sins with our own man-made fig leaves. It can only be overcome by Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus bore each aspect of that curse upon Adam and Eve in its totality. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. I want you to write that one down. Remember this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Jesus Christ bore the curse for all of us. You see, sin brought pain to childbirth. Jesus knew pain. Sin brought conflict. Jesus endured great conflict. Thorns came with sin, and Jesus endured a crown of thorns. Sin brought sweat and toil for the earth. Jesus sweat great drops of blood for us. Sin brought sorrow, and Jesus became a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And finally, sin brought death, and Jesus tasted death for every one of us, that we might be saved. Jesus bore the curse for every one of us. You know Jesus today? I pray that you do. In verse 20, he says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. <coughs> Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So here we see God now is going to clothe them. He's going to cover them. He's going to cover their sin. But in order for Adam and Eve to be clothed, what had to happen? He says he made tunics of skin. An animal had to die. Death had to happen. Without the shedding of blood, there was no remission. As Hebrews tells us. There's only two religions. There's a religion of the fig leaves. We cover ourselves. Or there's the religion of God's perfect provision through Jesus the sacrificial covering. And every other religion out there that man made or of mankind, there's always some covering you have to do for yourself. It's all about doing some work, getting to God, being good enough for God. But we know that doesn't work. So you have to have the covering of Jesus Christ, the perfect provision just like Adam and Eve tried to cover their selves and it didn't work, God had to cover them through a sacrifice, through the killing of an animal. I kind of take that, though, to mean that Adam and Eve were saved because God covered them, just like Jesus covered us. I think we'll see them in heaven. That's just my personal opinion. Because Adam had faith that God was going to send a Savior as He promised in, through Eve in that verse uh, that she would bring forth or the, the, through the seed, her seed. But we need to wrap this up tonight. Going a little long. So He says in verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So in his mercy, God's now going to protect Adam and Eve from what could only be described as a horrible fate of having to live forever as sinners with no hope of being saved. Had they eaten now as sinners of the tree of life, they would live forever as sinners. And so he sends them out of the garden. He kicks them out of the garden. And then he places a cherubim to guard the entrance. It's interesting, cherubim are always associated with the presence and the glory of God. We see that in Ezekiel and Isaiah and in Revelation. Whenever we see cherubim presented, represented on earth, um, for example, at the tabernacle, in the tabernacle in Exodus, we see that they mark a meeting place with God. So I believe that this was, for Adam and Eve, their holy of holies. It was still a place they could meet God. They just couldn't get to the tree anymore. The cherubim's going to stop them, going to block them. And this is be the last historical reference we have for the garden. So we don't know. Uh, we, I, we can only assume God didn't destroy the garden because he put cherubim there to guard it. But through the natural course of history and after the flood and all the other things that changed on the earth, um, we'll, we may never know exactly where it was. But for the sake of mankind and for Adam and Eve, it's gone. Never to be entered again until the day we're in the new heaven and the new earth. And forevermore, man has got to deal with the reality now of sin. And we're going to see just how horrible that reality can be when we see the first murder take place coming up pretty soon and uh, the whole rest of the Bible now this, this chapter is really the pivotal point is going to deal with man man's sin and how God is going to deal with man for the rest of history so we'll pick that up right there next week in chapter 4 and we'll stop there for tonight let's pray Heavenly Father we just thank you again for your word we thank you so much Lord for the clothing the covering that you provide through your son Jesus Christ Father my prayer is that that those that are listening out there tonight, those that may not know you, Lord, that they would seek you out. Because without you, Lord, we are all cursed. And so, Father, I just thank you. Thank you for taking on that curse for me. Father, I pray that as we go through this week, as we go through the next few days, Lord, until we meet again, that you would just give us direction, that you would fill our lives, Lord, with your light, that you would clothe us in your light, Lord, that we might be your light in this world, that we might shine your love on those around us. And so I ask your blessing on all those here tonight and all those watching and I lift them all up to you, Lord, all of us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.